Okay, so Martin, um, from what I understand is that uh, Resite is a, a non-profit organization uh, whose main mission is to make or to help to make um, amazing, lovable and successful cities. Um, and my question for you is, uh, what do you actually, what do you personally perceive uh, as a successful city? What is, what does make a city amazing, lovable and successful? Yeah. In my opinion, um, I think one of the most interesting things about cities are diversity. And so I think attracting people, different types of people to live, work and kind of play in the city is, is a successful strategy. Um, now, combining different types of people, different types of cultural backgrounds in a city uh, is rife with its own kind of challenges. Um, but I believe like for me this is the most important aspect of a city is, is attracting people to it. Uh, and in that sense if you attract people to stay in your city, to live in your city, uh, if you can attract businesses to move to your city, then I would say that's in some ways a success. Uh, now, once those people get there, uh, success means something different, right? You have to sort of accommodate them, you have to have a political process that's open and transparent uh, to them, and you have to sort of involve the community in the decision-making process of the city. That's a different level of success once you have an established kind of citizen group, uh, uh, you have a, a successful economy. So there's no clean answer to that question. Um, okay, but, so you, but you're already talking about successful economy. Uh, so um, when we're talking about a successful city um, and a successful economy, we're mostly talking about attracting people who help the city to make profit. I guess and um, ah, okay so there are certain groups of people which actually do fall that's into that's your the opinion of, of uh, <laughs> is that what you think well that's how I understand that's how I interpret the, the way you're describing an amazing successful city why and would you interpret it that way especially because uh, you're talking about attracting people into the city uh, and then talking about successful economy um, and uh, I just don't uh, really imagine um, that uh, some um, politicians would imagine a successful city as one that, for example, attracts seniors or, uh, you know, low-income populations or um, less educated people. You know, I'm talking about uh, the, uh, let's say, uh, more excluded uh, social groups or the groups which are not participating in creating economic wealth as much as the kind of people that I imagine Recite is targeting or that you're talking about when uh, in connection with a successful city so yeah. but they actually the diversity of a city is uh, probably about these people too I think yeah I think you might have missed that in the first part uh, I think a uh, successful city in your opinion might be attracting uh, profit but in my I think for us it's it's more about providing chances for everybody and providing equity in the economy, providing equity in opportunities in the city, um, providing equity in, in the access to public resources, to civic architecture. But uh, a successful city doesn't mean just like focusing on high income, high net worth people. Uh, and that's certainly not what Resite is focused on. We're focused on creating opportunities uh, in the city. And that means opportunities for everyone from uh, every income level, every social status, every age demographic. But, but I, I definitely think that uh, this, this is great that uh, there is so much interest in urban space currently, but uh, what I find is that uh, most of it is very um, still like superficial design oriented. It's mostly like about um, uh, like cool places, creating uh, nice uh, nice uh, spaces for consumption, nice spaces for successful people to spend time in, such as here, for example. Uh, but we're not really talking about places for, like, it's, it's almost as if uh, we forgot that the kind of city that we're helping to create, which is still essentially a neoliberal city, is actually leaving all these people behind who are, who cannot take advantage of all these nice spaces and they uh, are struggling to survive in such a city because in fact what we're seeing in Prague right now is that uh, the more successful the city has become and the more uh, profit it's making, the more it's becoming uh, exclusive for uh, an increasing uh, range of people. 
Do you think that uh, maybe in some ways Reside is contributing to that? That is uh, reinforcing this idea of a city that is in a way um, only for people who are successful and who can make it in a, you know? Because like, well, I, I don't know, I'm just like trying to imagine what would happen if a homeless person came here and <laughs> to manifesto. Yeah. We would probably accept them like anyone else. Uh, so everyone's accepted here. The, one of the things we like about, uh, so manifesto is uh, my project. And, and one of the things that I've heard people like about manifesto is that well, while like I'd say most of the demographic around is younger, like under the age of 45, um, there's a lot of families here. There are some seniors here, like there's some sitting in the long table right now. Um, people come in from buses from other countries that are, are sitting on the sidewalk. It's kind of a mix of different types of people. Well, uh, you have to spend money here. Uh, well, you can always hang out if you want to, but, but while it's, uh, there's food and there's beverages and things, there's free cultural activities like three or four nights a week. Um, we'll increase that kind of activity. So like I would say like, this project does try to incorporate anyone who wants to come in and enjoy themselves. How did you pick this location for Manifesto? Uh, the location came about after like six months, maybe even more, like eight months of trying to find other locations. Um, we, we were negotiating with a landowner in, in Prague 8, in Karlin, um, who owns a parking lot that wasn't being used, I thought, to its potential is sort of right in the middle of the residential district so it had a lot of community impact um, but after like six months of waiting for an answer uh, they told us no and we had a deadline uh, okay. that that week we were helping organize a student competition for this project called super studio yeah. and uh, we needed to know basically in like two days where the site was going to be for the competition or we had to withdraw and we didn't want to withdraw so uh, we, did, we realized that we hadn't asked about this site yet and it took like one phone call and they, uh, they thought it was a good idea and the next day they told us we could use it for the competition and then we could talk more about after if we would actually build something here. And so it was actually you first uh, approaching Penta? Yes. Uh, rather yeah. than uh, the other way around? Yeah, yeah. Because in we some wanted way, to be in Carlene. Yeah, okay. Because uh, in many ways it reminds me of this uh, gentrification pioneering practice from New York from the 80s. I don't know if you are aware of uh, no. the, the practice where developers would ask uh, like, you know, um, the artists and uh, the young creative uh, community uh, to uh, open up creative or um, like galleries and different creative centers in brownfield areas in order to uh, destigmatize these areas uh, and in this way they, these people were serving developers uh, and then uh, in this way they initiated gentrification of these areas and then they were... So, you're, so the question is that you're assuming is that um, I'm serving the interests of Penta by doing our project here? Well, I think that they're certainly not going to lose... Yeah, I see, the, I see the world in less skeptical terms all the time. Maybe I shouldn't be because I'm naive, but... Uh, no, it was, it was definitely our idea. We approached Penta about this. and So what, uh, what would you like to see here? Oh, what I would like to see is maybe uh, something more community-based, something like, uh, like, for example, stores which are operated by the locals. These are all so, local businesses. Yeah, but they're already established businesses. Not all of them. There's three, there's three new restaurants here. Okay. But uh, a, uh, something, something more uh, like uh, grassroots, you know, something more like bottom-up. Uh, like what? This is bottom up. This is a, by an NGO with basically no resources and, uh, and another cultural organization, Aerofilms. Yeah, well, this I is don't the, know. This is the like, definition of bottom up. I guess that even if these guys uh, are bottom up, they're probably trying to maybe take advantage of the location. And uh, because like some of the prices that, uh, that are charged here, uh, I find them ridiculous, you know, like 79 crowns for a flavichke. So, so That's the, just. I'll put the question back. Okay, so we should ask the restaurant owners about the prices. <laughs> But I'll put the question back on you. If you wanted to have a bottom-up, in your definition, kind of civic society or civic uh, center, um, who pays for it? Well, uh, do you have to pay to rent this space? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we have a lease for this space. But this is not free. The containers cost something. Like, uh, the chairs we're sitting on cost something. But this You have to wash the glasses every day. I know, but it's, it's, it's actually the only way we can do something about brownfield areas uh, it doesn't always have to be 
something that's about profit, you know, like the developers like Penta makes tons of money, right? Uh, they should maybe have some social responsibility as well. And like, for example, they created this big building Florentinum right here and they're going to build more and they're probably, pro they're probably going to sell most of it to foreign investors, okay? So they're actually like selling out our city piece by piece to foreign investors. So a bunch of foreign investors are going to own a big chunk in the center of Prague and they can't even provide a little feel for free, you know, for some cultural events which are bottom-up, non-profit, totally, you know, made for the community, which are inclusive. I just think that, um, however, okay, it's already uh, a well-known fact that developers and investors do not tend to be very socially responsible especially not the ones in, uh, in the Czech Republic because uh, they are not required to be socially responsible by our politicians. I, I appreciate the criticisms of the private sector yeah. because without it you won't have any change. Um, but I think the idea of like just doing something because it's good is great, but someone's got to pay for it. Uh, and, and that's our argument uh, on these kind of initiatives or public space investments all the time, that there's nothing is free. and, and in society, except for well, except in a for society air. which is set up the way it is, it's and the air isn't even free. So, the air isn't free. So, like, th there's nothing that's free in society. Well, so we still have a long way uh, to to teach developers so in architects? this country to to be socially responsible, I guess. Uh, yeah, and I think um, like, uh, and, and Penta is like uh, gets a lot of criticism, but um, the, the, they rent us this land for for nearly nothing. We have a lease, but it's uh, it's very friendly. And they contribute a lot to what Recite does. So I have nothing bad to say about Penta. They, they have uh, allowed us to, to run conferences. They don't kind of dictate anything we do uh, in terms of content. I, I find it even funny that uh, that actually that you actually have to pay anything for this spot because they should actually be paying you for you know making this space more attractive, uh, considering that they're planning to build here in the future. Yeah, they so are a sponsor of the space also. So. I would like to talk about uh, the topic of uh, this year's Recite conference, which is uh, accommodate or accommodation. Uh, so first of all, I would like to know how do you actually pick the topics of the conferences? That's not an easy question to answer. Uh, maybe the hardest one you've asked. The topic of housing came out of like basically six years of Recite um, before it. Whereas like almost every discussion, like public space or transportation infrastructure or, uh, or quality of life issues in the past informed uh, us to say like, every year we talked about cost of living, in fact. Uh, it might have been about public space, but somehow cost of living was a concern. And I think like there's no other fundamental issue of the city, which is we think is a fundamental right of the city, than your house. Um, so we found that like we have to address affordability, quality of life, and housing in the same discussion. And in this in this year's uh, in this year's format. So we did that. We we talked about why there's a affordability challenge in cities. Um, what are the responses to that? And if the responses are going to be that we're living in more dense urban environments and maybe smaller kind of quarters, then we should have a more active kind of cultural and more rich cultural life in the city. And that's a pretty positive discussion. And what I found in this discussion is that, uh, like, interestingly, we had mostly international participants this year, the, the biggest amount of international participants that, that we've ever had. And they're all really positive. Like, that they understand that there's challenges in the world. But they're but positive in what sense? That they have solutions uh -huh. and they're willing to test them. But these are solutions which are mostly about people adapting to uh, the fact that housing is unaffordable from what I understand because, okay, yeah. you're talking about densification, living in small, smaller quarters, like possibly like mini homes, things like that. But it's just about people just, you know, tightening up their belts even more just like you know get, live it, trying to survive in even smaller uh, smaller spaces well, that's uh, your that's again that's your view uh, on this I don't know that's, yeah. that's the way it sounds because like I mean okay when you were talking about the, the affordability issue uh, why, why do why do you personally uh, think uh, that the housing has become so unaffordable 
in, uh, in Prague and in other major cities? Well, in Prague, it's, it's pretty like it's pretty easy in Prague. Like if you, there's a there's a shortage of flats. Yeah, but why? Because it takes so long to build them. It takes eight years. Do you think that there might be some other explanations? Of course, there's a global economy at, at play, and and that also has impacts on on the local economy. But uh, and and by the way, this is a, a inaffordability or rising cost of housing has been an issue since like at least post World War, uh, and and it's like uh, it's now getting uh, worse in cities like New York and London and Hong Kong. Uh, but it's uh, it's catching up in cities like um, like Prague. So this is a kind of global urban uh, phenomena that the more kind of attractive a city becomes for business, the more expensive it becomes. And at the same time, in a city like Prague, it takes longer to build flats. Uh, and the government is, is, is not spending enough, uh, his, as they have historically, to provide affordable and social solutions. Yes, sure. But and don't you think that the problem is also that uh, uh, housing has become um, a commodity, not just something that's for people to like a like a need. Like housing has become something that doesn't serve just people to to live, but it also serves investors to uh, invest their money. Seventy-six percent of the people in the Czech Republic own their homes, so they obviously also see it as a, as an economic vehicle. Um, yeah, but that's a legacy, okay? But the people who are born now, like the new generation, which didn't inherit house or which didn't uh, which had, didn't have the same opportunity to privatize uh, their socialist uh, apartment uh, after the revolution they are in a completely different situation they are very disadvantaged so there we, we've got rising inequalities between generations in the Czech Republic and it's really like sometimes you can see people who are a low-income household and they own their own apartment because they were able to buy it for a fragment of a, the market price in the 1990s and then you see people who are actually making good money, but they are struggling because they have to pay really expensive rent. There, there, there certainly is a case, but we don't know how many people uh, or what percentage people are actually paying. I know in New York City, it's also something like if you pay 40% of your income in, in housing costs, then you're also a, a, eligible for affordable housing. But there's less and less affordable housing being offered in New York City. More of it's being privatized. And therefore, you have a growing uh, need for affordable and social solutions. It's basically the same everywhere. The only city that is not the same is Vienna and in some Scandinavian cities where, where in fact like more than 50 to 60 percent of their people own, uh, rent their houses. Or yeah, in Germany. Yeah, council flats with regulated rents. Yeah, in Germany, 45 percent of the people are, are also renting uh, mostly regulated uh, homes. In, in, in Vienna, it's uh, what, 60, 67 percent of all the flats on the market are regulated by, by the, the government. So. Those are the cities where you tend not to have a, a housing problem. Okay, well, I'm, I'm glad to hear that. I think that we're uh, supposed to finish not here, so. Okay. <laughs> so that's a good conclusion that uh, we should take example from Vienna. Build social, uh, social, social housing, affordable housing like Vienna. Yeah. I don't think that. Well, uh, no, I, I think that Vienna is a good, good solution, but they also have a very healthy private market. Vienna is also one of the, the most like six, maybe financially successful cities on the planet. Uh, it's always categorized as a very livable city. So there's something that works in Vienna, which is long-term thinking. Yeah. And I think like just categorizing it as like the government is, is providing all the housing is wrong. No. Uh, it's no, it's, that, it's the it. fact that like there's a good cooperation between private sector, civic sector, culture sector, and, and uh, government sector. And they have a long-term vision for what it means to be Viennese. And everyone sort of gets on that train and moves it forward. Yeah. Um, just saying the government provides everything is not the right solution. <laughs> it generally doesn't work throughout history that way. Okay. But yeah, that's the, that's the message. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for the interview. Thank you.